Good evening and assalamu alaikum and welcome from ThinkFest Pakistan. We are very happy uh, today to be launching a very important book on the history of Pakistan. Uh, it is a book on uh, the history of British diplomacy in Pakistan from 1947 onwards. Uh, the book has been written uh, by Professor Ian uh, Talbot, who actually joins us here uh, from Southampton uh, to uh, discuss the book. Uh, I should say that you know I have a personal connection with uh, with Professor Talbot because he was my PhD examiner. Uh, so it is a great honor uh, now to actually host uh, Professor Talbot for his book book launch. Um, I should note that Professor Talbot has written uh, seminal books on on Pakistan. Uh, if you are someone who is uh, who has taken any course in Pakistan studies, I think about half of the universities in Pakistan use his. Uh, history of Pakistan as the textbook. Uh, so I'm sure a lot of you uh, recognize uh, the face, recognize the book um, and his work. Um, and I think it's quite safe to, to, to say that, that he's a foremost historian of Pakistan at the moment. Uh, so we are very thankful and grateful, uh, Professor Talbot, uh, that you've been able to uh, join us, uh, at least virtually this but you know, physically, I hope soon, uh, so that we can have a longer and uh, more expansive discussion on this book. Uh, we are also very grateful that uh, Dr. Malia Lodi has actually joined us uh, for this uh, book launch. Uh, Dr. Malia Lodi uh, has had a distinguished career as a journalist. Uh, she was editor of, of the news, the Muslim, and several other newspapers. Uh, but for the last couple of decades, she has had an exemplary career in terms of uh, in terms of uh, diplomacy. And she has been Pakistan's ambassador to the United States, Pakistan's um, high commissioner to, to the UK, Pakistan's uh, permanent representative to the United Nations amongst several of her hats. Uh, I won't mention for how long she has been a diplomat now, uh, but she lo looks young as ever. So we are very grateful, uh, Dr. Lodi, that you have taken time to join us tonight, uh, because I think it's really important uh, for us to get your perspective, a Pakistani's perspective, especially a Pakistani who has been a high commissioner uh, to the UK, to really understand this. Uh, we're also very grateful today uh, that we have the current UK High Commissioner to Pakistan, Dr. Christian Turner, joining us today. Uh, of course, as the current High Commissioner, the, the pressure is on him to uh, keep on a very distinguished uh, legacy. And uh, he has followed uh, lots of distinguished names that Professor Talbot will, will very soon talk about. Uh, and these are the people who have actually played an integral role in the development of Pakistan, in fact, led Pakistan's development and, and influenced Pakistan's development in myriad of ways. So uh, we are very thankful that Dr. Turner has actually joined us. And we hope to hear more from you know, his reflection on the past, but also, of course, uh, his reflection on the current role of the British High Commission and how he is taking the conversation forward. So we are very grateful for this wonderful panel. Uh, and now I will turn to Professor Talbot uh, to int introduce the book to us and uh, kind of explain some of its major themes. Over to you, Professor. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Yaku. Uh, and um, I'm delighted to be able to introduce uh, the book at uh, the Think Fest in front of such a distinguished panel. Um, the, the book is scope really is to cover um, the British diplomatic field mission within Pakistan itself, both uh, at the headquarters, but also in, uh, what is sometimes called the outposts, deputy high commissions, really over the seven decades since the creation of Pakistan. And no other study has done this. Uh, and I think that um, in that sense alone, it's a pioneering work. And I was able to to draw on my long-standing interest in Pakistan history to inform this, but also to uncover some fresh archival material, both in the UK and in the United States uh, when I was uh, researching this, and also to interview uh, some previous uh, UK High Commissioners uh, as well. So this study uh, is bringing new sources to bear on looking uh, at the history of the diplomatic uh, mission over these seven decades. And in some respects, I think that the, the institutional history uh, of the uh, diplomatic mission mirrors that uh, of Pakistan itself. 
uh, in the sense that um, it was created in the chaotic conditions of uh, post-partition Karachi. Uh, it then, of course, uh, made a temporary move to Ralpindi uh, in the 1960s, uh, and that reflected the power which had shifted uh, from uh, the civilians to the military uh, in Pakistan. Uh, and then, of course, uh, finally to its, uh, its current and home, uh, which I had the pleasure of visiting uh, while I was researching uh, this work uh, in Islamabad. So it, it reflects some of the changes uh, in uh, Pakistan's domestic politics. Obviously, the book also reflects on the changes in Britain's position in the world uh, in these seven decades. Also, some of the changes in the international history uh, of the South Asia region uh, in this period of time. And there have, of course, been uh, continuities uh, in terms of uh, the troubled relationship between uh, India and Pakistan, but also uh, new developments over this period of time, especially, of course, uh, with the rise of China uh, as a significant uh, player uh, globally, as well as within the South Asia region. And obviously, uh, the United States' uh, interests uh, in this region as well, arising really from the Cold War and the Cold War perspective. Uh, but then, of course, going up to um, the, the contemporary uh, so-called War on Terror uh, uh, as well. So this is a region which has been very important uh, geopolitically, a region which has uh, gone under uh, numerous transformations. And the story really is how the High Commission and the Outpost have adapted uh, to these changing contexts uh, over this period of time. And also, finally, I should perhaps mention uh, that the changes arising from uh, two fairly recent developments, sometimes called digital diplomacy, uh, the availability of social media uh, for a public diplomacy, which has always been an important part of, of diplomacy to reach out uh, much more than previously. Uh, and that's been a major uh, development uh, in the last decade or so. And also, of course, the context uh, of the, the rise of a self-confident uh, and increasingly significant uh, Pakistani British uh, community. And this has transformed um, the possibilities uh, for public diplomacy, along with social media, because the successes of this uh, community within the UK can very much give a positive image uh, of the UK to Pakistan. Also, of course, uh, this community is very engaged uh, in philanthropy, uh, in trade uh, with uh, the homeland, and also engaged with the politics uh, as well. So this is a changing environment uh, for uh, the, the High Commission, uh, which uh, I'm sure the other panelists may well have something uh, to, to say about. So that's really the scope uh, of, of the, uh, the, the volume. What about the themes uh, within the volume? And I think one of the arguments uh, that I put forward in this is that um, Britain uh, has had a remarkable ability to use the cliche punch above its weight uh, diplomatically uh, in Pakistan. Uh, over this uh, period of time. Uh, and I tried to uncover reasons to explain this, uh, why that Britain uh, has been able to do this. And there are a number of uh, avenues that you can pursue uh, in terms particularly of uh, the targeting of aid uh, in recent years. Uh, it's never on the level of uh, resources that um, the United States in the past or China in the present uh, is, is able to uh, direct to Pakistan, but it's been adroitly targeted in areas like education uh, and also uh, to a, a advance um, social modernization in terms of uh, gender empowerment as well. That's been another key uh, aim of British uh, diplomacy. Uh, so there's this targeting of uh, resources, uh, the adroit use of um, the new digital diplomacy and i look at that in uh, the penultimate chapter uh, of the volume but also i argue that um, the 
diasporic uh, influence of uh, British Pakistanis has become a resource which has been important for Britain. But there are other reasons as well. And in the early chapters uh, of, of the volume, I, I explore some of these. Uh, you might call them hangovers from the colonial period, if you want to use that uh, terminology. Uh, but, but what is quite remarkable, I think, is that um, the positivity uh, that Pakistanis have had uh, towards Britain uh, as a former colonial ruler, you don't get this in many other uh, post-colonial contexts. So how can you explain it? Uh, I suppose one of the explanations, of course, is that the freedom struggle uh, in uh, Pakistan was not directed solely against the British, but was also directed in the context of the fear of Hindu majoritarianism. Uh, and uh, in a sense, I think uh, that may partly explain, although there were differences of uh, the treatment of the two countries with the boundary award, and, and other issues uh, immediately after uh, partition. Nonetheless, British rule had enabled uh, the creation of Pakistan. Uh, and I think that that's an important uh, legacy. Also, of course, the legacies in terms of uh, connections, not just with civilians, but also uh, with the military uh, after independence. Because of course, the Pakistan army was the inheritor of the British Indian army in many ways. Uh, and uh, those relationships uh, were there. Uh, and of course, the British Indian Army's major recruitment area was in uh, areas which became Pakistan uh, after uh, partition. It's true, it was also in the Indian Punjab with the Sikh element, but certainly uh, Ralpendi, Jhelum area was always a, an important uh, area for military recruitment. So there's that tradition as well. And also there's a tr tradition, I think, an interest uh, in Pakistani society, which certainly the first generation of diplomats uh, inherited almost naturally as a result of ICS, uh, Indian civil service uh, work. Uh, it, it's important to note that some of the first uh, deputy high commissioners were people who had long standing uh, roots in the areas in which they were working. Uh, Leonard Coke Wallace, for example, the first Deputy High Commissioner in uh, Dhaka, uh, had first served in Bengal in 1924, and he had a wealth of uh, connections uh, in that region. Uh, uh, there were others, of course, who were serving in uh, what was West Pakistan, uh, who had this historical connection uh, to, to fall back on. And I think that that gave um, an awareness of uh, Pakistani society and how it operates, which gave Britain uh, this opportunity perhaps to punch above its weight. And I'm arguing in this book that personal connections are always important in diplomacy wherever you are, but I think they're particularly significant within the Pakistan context, given um, the relatively small um, military civil elite uh, in the country, uh, the, the role of uh, certainly uh, kinship, is very important and to be able to connect uh, and understand how that society operates i think has been something which successive generations of british diplomats uh, have had and i mean this goes right the way up until the 1990s when um nicholas barrington uh, who was a long-standing um, both ambassador when um, Pakistan was outside of the Commonwealth and also High Commissioner actually drew up genealogical charts of, of leading landowning families uh, in Pakistan and had a, a, a scholarly engagement uh, with, uh, with Pakistani society. So I think there's that element there which may be lacking in some other countries' connections uh, with Pakistan. And, and that uh, I think is another factor when we're looking at all of these factors that may come into play in terms of uh, how Britain could have this uh, ability to, uh, to be influential uh, within Pakistan. Of course, there were some disadvantages of, of um, the colonial heritage. I'm not trying to present a rose tinted uh, view uh, of uh, the colonial inheritance. And one of the problems, of course, and it's another theme which runs throughout uh, British diplomatic history and is uh, as important today as it ever was, and that is of trying to balance 
uh, interest in India and interest in Pakistan. And it's almost like walking a tightrope in terms of um, not wanting to be seen to be favoring. Uh, this is not at the high commission level, of course, uh, but uh, at the government level, you know, to be favoring one side or the other. Uh, and certainly at times, I think uh, Pakistanis have probably felt um, disappointed when there's apparently been a tilt uh, from London towards India. And I'm thinking, especially at the time of the 1971, uh, crisis facing uh, Pakistan, but earlier times, certainly perhaps 1947-48, again, uh, when some Pakistanis were hoping that uh, Britain would be more supportive over their stance on Kashmir uh, than, they, uh, than the government of the day actually was. So there are these legacies, you know, of, of uh, wanting to balance the interests of two important South Asian countries, both of whom for much of their post-independence history have been members of the Commonwealth. Uh, and uh, there is the need to balance that, uh, I think, uh, interest. And it's not always an easy thing to do. Uh, but uh, there are many other advantages, which I think Britain has over other countries. And, and certainly, uh, I think that um, the relational, as I call it, diplomacy uh, that uh, Britain and successive high commissioners have followed in Pakistan has uh, given perhaps um, more sense of um, emotional relationship with Pakistanis and perhaps the Americans who have what I would call a more transactional uh, approach uh, to, to dealing with, with Pakistan and may have put in infinitely more resources uh, than Britain is capable of doing, but is never necessarily always uh, received perhaps with uh, what the Americans would want to see, the degree of gratitude uh, from Pakistanis. So there is this difference, uh, I think, in how diplomacy operates uh, in Pakistan. And uh, in a way, I, this makes it, of course, an interesting case study for what is sometimes called the new diplomatic history which is very much about uh, looking at the embedded nature of diplomacy, looking, about per looking at personal connections and their importance uh, in, in diplomacy. Uh, and uh, Pakistan, I think, very much reflects that, uh, that trend in diplomatic writing, which of course emerged in resistance to the, the notion that perhaps um, resident uh, embassies were no longer necessary in a digital world. And, and, and that you could have a, 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 a sort of um, representation uh, of, of almost a naked diplomat, you know, with just their smartphone uh, in, in operation and you didn't need uh, to, to necessarily have that presence. So I think that the, that's where this new diplomatic history is a pushback uh, as far as, uh, as that is concerned. But certainly in terms of, I think the, the British experience in Pakistan, it's, it, it's certainly, revealed uh, looking at these seven decades of how important actually having people there on the spot uh, who have the personal connections who have the understanding uh, uh, is in terms of diplomatic activity and indeed perhaps to be able to filter because we're living in an age where we have uh, information overkill to a large extent so you've got to be able to filter that information and you've got to be able to know how to network as well in terms of uh, dealing with a, a particular society and culture. And I think that that's where the permanent um, residency and um, child, you know, the whole sort of diplomatic setup, you know, it, it is important. So those are some of the themes. I mean, there are other themes also, sub themes, which which run through the, uh, the volume. And, and as also, I think what is important is I'm trying to bring out the personalities of some of these um, serving uh, high commissioners. Because of course, whilst they are following uh, the policy laid down by London, uh, nonetheless, their own personalities, their own preferences uh, can impact on the successful delivery uh, of, of that policy. So if you read the book, you'll see that uh, there are quite a lot of biographical details there uh, of uh, some of the uh, often very colorful characters who have served uh, in uh, the British 
uh, diplomatic corps uh, within Pakistan, not just at the high commission level, but also in the outposts, uh, which I think are important and have certainly been neglected. Uh, so I, I hope that gives a flavor uh, of uh, what the book is about and some of the things I was trying to achieve in it. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Ian, for a very uh, sort of uh, good overview of the book. Um, and I must say, I, I do want to ask you a specific question before I move. I, I, I move on. But I, you know, it uh, when when you were talking about Sir Nicholas Barrington, um, I kind of remember that when I began my my uh, PhD, uh, one fine day I received a phone call from him, uh, and he asked me to come and see him in the Athenaeum, and I didn't know why he wanted to see me. Uh, so you know, there I am, like you know, like a, you know. 19 year old uh, a bit scared and saying why does the former high commissioner want to see me and i go there and, and he gives me this like big sort of envelope and he says these are all the genealogies you'd ever need because i've worked on these princes and i know all these families and everything <laughs> and they were so meticulously done i was just fascinated like my jaw dropped and you know it took me about like 20 25 minutes you know there was a moment that i wanted to take in entering the Athenaeum, but you know then i was so engrossed looking at these genealogies and how uh, carefully he had actually uh, sort of noted everyone and who's married where and who's connected where uh, that it was just just simply fascinating and I and I wondered actually how many diplomats any longer kind of take the time to to do that you know by the late 80s and the early 90s that, that he was there uh, was any diplomat actually uh, making that much effort in trying to understand a country that deep but the question that I really wanted to ask you was, uh, since that's a, that uh, uh, was about the first sort of 10, 15 years of Pakistan, because that's a period I, I work, work on currently, is that how far do you think these diplomats and their personal kind of connection to uh, uh, Pakistan affected the way that British policy was realized in the region? Uh, so one of the things which, 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 which really fascinated me was the fact that uh, a lot of the uh, British diplomats, uh, especially at the Deputy High Commission level, had either been in the ICS or had been in the uh, Indian Indian political service. And the dispatches, the optoms, as as they were called, uh, mentioned variously that you know, oh, I met this person, and of course, I've known him for for thirty years, uh, and I know this 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 person, and of course, I've made him do this, and of course, this reminds me of you know someone like Sir uh, Sir uh, George Cunningham, who of course wasn't a British diplomat, but the first governor in independent Pakistan of the NWFP. You know, the princely states which are which were on the frontier would not have exceeded if it weren't for him, and him personally guaranteeing that you'll be fine in in Pakistan. So if you could speak about that formative phase of Pakistan and the role of the high commissions uh, and, the, and the people in the high commissions and the deputy high commissions at that time, I think that'll be uh, sort of one interesting uh, question that I do want to ask. Yes, I mean, that's, that's a very good question, Yakub. Uh, obviously, um, there is a, almost what I would call a transitional state uh, operating in Pakistan, certainly in the first year or so after independence, not just because of uh, the diplomats, but because the point you mentioned with Cunningham, um, there were British governors uh, of key provinces. Punjab uh, had a British governor, uh, obviously the frontier had a British governor. Um, the British were still very significant in the Pakistan military uh, in this period of time. Uh, so that there is a kind of transition because of course Pakistan desperately needed uh, the expertise uh, of those Britons who were prepared to stay on uh, after independence. And there tended to be uh, people who had um, sympathies uh, with the Muslim League uh, in the colonial era. I, I don't want to simplify it in, uh, and say that, you know, the divisions within uh, British opinion relating to uh, the Kashmir issue a just break down in terms of uh, those who had ties with Congress uh, before partition and those who had ties with the Muslim League. But nonetheless, there was quite a deep sympathy uh, for the Pakistan po po uh, position amongst uh, the, these early diplomats. And certainly, uh, in some senses, they may, uh, in terms of what's going on in the tribal areas, for example, know more than the Pakistani officials themselves do, who, who don't have this um, sort of deep knowledge uh, and, and connection with the region. And, and I think that that's quite important. Uh, so that um, this transition 
it's not always been, I, I think, fully acknowledged, you know, in terms of Pakistan's early history. And also, of course, on a diplomatic front itself, it means that um, the US, although it's beginning to have Cold War concerns about the region, we're very much prepared at this stage uh, to defer to British knowledge uh, and understanding uh, of, of Pakistan. And uh, so uh, what the Americans knew about the early stages of the unfolding of the Kashmir issue uh, was very much uh, filtered through, I think, British knowledge uh, and uh, appreciation of, of what is going on. And I think that's quite a significant uh, point, really, which isn't always uh, picked up in some of the, uh, the general literature. And of course, and I think that, that that's a very important point that, of course, there were these diplomatic posts, but there were all these other people. Uh, you know, I just mentioned one very interesting uh, sort of thing when I was working on the history of the High Court of Lahore. I realized, uh, and he might have been the last person, that uh, the Chief of the High Court of Lahore in 1966 was an, uh, was an Englishman. And uh, apparently, he had never taken the oath on the constitution of Pakistan. Uh, so in 1966, the justice was going to the country and they asked him to, to uh, take an oath. Uh, and of course, the oath said that, you know, I will be loyal to Pakistan and blah, blah. And it was very interesting. And he said, well, but I'm not a Pakistani citizen. Uh, and what they did was they were like, well, even if you're not a Pakistani citizen, just take an oath to the, to the queen and it'll be fine. Uh, and then the government of Pakistan recommends him for a knighthood and he, and he gets it and then retires to Australia. So it's very interesting that in Pakistan, this process actually extends over a considerable period of time. Uh, and, it's, and it's very, very, very influential at that level. But let me bring in uh, Dr. Lodi here, uh, because of course you have looked at, uh, you know, as Professor uh, uh, Talbot has actually, you know, looked at the British side. Uh, but you have sort of looked at it from the from the from the Pakistani side. You have dealt with British diplomats. You've worked with them. You have served as the High Commissioner in the UK. Um, how do you understand the historic role of Britain? But also, uh, you know, the 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 developing and the continuing role of Britain and British dip diplomacy in the Pakistani context. Uh, thank you, um, Yaqub and Ian, if I may call you by your first name, and Christian, if I may call you by your first name, I think it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I mean, I obviously have seen it from the other side, as it were, uh, how British diplomacy worked, and I was engaged in Pakistani diplomacy. But I mean, let me give you a Pakistani perspective before I come to uh, Yaqub, what you have asked, uh, my observation. Uh, and I want to say a few things about Ian's book, because that's why we're here. Uh, you know, as a, as a Pakistani um, who was accredited to the court of St. James's um, for five years, um, I can say that, you know, the relationship between Pakistan and, the, and Britain has always been a high priority for Islamabad. Um, and the reason for this is, of course, uh, something that Ian talks about, which is, you know, uh, ties of sentiment, as he calls them, uh, history, uh, we have a shared history. Uh, and of course, uh, more recently, as Ian also underlines in his book, uh, the 1.6 million strong British Pakistani community um, in, uh, in, in Britain. So, I mean, for Pakistan, this is an important relationship uh, to keep working at. Uh, London has always been a coveted uh, posting uh, for Pakistani diplomats. And I can tell you from my own personal experience, and I think that plays a little to what Ian was talking about, you know, the ease with which I was able to function, uh, the access that I was able to have uh, to 10 Downing Street, uh, to um, obviously the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. And of course, because the Commonwealth Secretariat is in London and we were in the Commonwealth for part of the time that I was there serving, um, you know, so there was, there was a lot to do there. Uh, and for Pakistan also, because uh, Britain is a, non -perm uh, is a permanent member actually uh, of the UN Security Council, so, you know, we have both bilateral and multilateral issues uh, that are important, which gives uh, Britain an important uh, place uh, in Pakistan's diplomacy. So, you know, I've kind of witnessed it from the other side and I, uh, you know, will say very quickly uh, that my four uh, sort of takeaways from Ian's book are very quickly, uh, you know, I don't want to spend that much time because I want to say a little bit, I mean, a couple of anecdotes of my own a period in London, which also gives you a sense of how close the relationship has been over, the, over time. 
Uh, first, of course, uh, you know, his description uh, of UK's ties with Pakistan being based on sentiment uh, in contrast to the relationship with the United States, where I was also accredited twice as ambassador, uh, and those relations being transactional, as Ian just pointed out, uh, I, that's an important takeaway. Uh, the second assertion, which I entirely agree with, uh, that you know, in its relationship with uh, Pakistan, Britain has exercised an influence far greater uh, than its actual power uh, would suggest. Uh, and there are many reasons for that we can get into uh, later. The third takeaway uh, is that this disproportionate influence, of course, owes itself to colonial era links, uh, as well as to the large uh, now and you know Pakistani British uh, community in the United Kingdom, which is a living bridge uh, between uh, our two countries and really helps to cement uh, the relationship. Uh, now, of course, uh, Ian mentions an important factor, which he's also reiterated uh, in his remarks, which is the role played by personal diplomacy. I think this is key uh, because I myself found, uh, for example, I was there <clears throat> at the time of um, uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair's, uh, you know, he was the Prime Minister at that time. And I had a very good uh, relationship with the Prime Minister himself. Uh, Sherry Blair happened to become a very good friend of mine. Uh, and again, you know, it, it, it sort of helped to know uh, people right at the top, um, but this was not the only reason uh, why one was able to get one's way uh, in London. Of course, one had access to important members of parliament. It is a parliamentary system. So it was important for us to also uh, have a good relationship there. But I would say that, you know, and I think Christian would, would, would agree that, you know, looking at it from the Islamabad, you know, I was looking at it as somebody serving in London, but if one looks at it from the Islamabad point of view, I think two things have really helped uh, Britain. One, uh, the work of the British Council, extremely important. Uh, I remember the time when the British Council had one of the best libraries uh, in, in, in town, uh, that was some time ago. But, you know, activities like that really helped. I think also, uh, the work of DFID, uh, which Ian just mentioned. I think DFID, of course, the amount, the resources that it spent in Pakistan were not that large compared to USAID. But when I was uh, serving in Washington, I would often tell people that USAID needs to learn how to do targeted work from DFID, uh, DFID. Uh, they, did they do a remarkable job. So, you know, I have to say. Now, the fourth takeaway so soft power, I think, has been a very important uh, instrument uh, that uh, Britain has used very, very effectively and very successfully. And the fourth takeaway from Ian's book, because you know we're here to talk about his book as well, is you know how closely British diplomats have worked uh, with their American counterparts here, even if they had different equities uh, in the relationship with Islamabad, and they did have different equities. I mean, at times, especially in the post 9-11 period, in the wake of 9-11, they worked very, very closely together. But I did find that at times when, the, when Britain had its own dynamics in terms of you know, its relations with my country, uh, I was hard pressed to explain at times to Islamabad that Britain is not acting at US behest. There seemed to be a kind of a presumption that uh, you know, Britain is doing this or it's asking us for something because the US is asking them. And I would have to say to them, no, um, you know, Britain has its own policy, even though they work in very close tandem uh, uh, with, with the US. Then I think, you know, and I would round off uh, with a couple of anecdotes, if I may, Yakub, and then hand over uh, to High Commissioner Turner. I think uh, <laughs> when I first arrived in London, um, you know, and I remember British civil servants were sort of telling me how best to deal with the uh, presentation of my credentials. And I think this, the reason I'm relating this anecdote is because it shows the kind of relationship that exists between our two countries. So you present your credentials, of course, to the queen uh, in Britain. And uh, so I was told, you know, no politics. You are not to discuss any politics with the queen, no geopolitics, nothing. And I said, absolutely, you know, I will, I will follow your advice, of course. You're, you're, you know, uh, you're my host, so I, I don't have a choice. So here I was, and immediately uh, the Queen made me feel so comfortable. I mean, it was instant. Um, and because I was one of the first, in fact, I probably was the first woman to represent my country there. So, you know, she was quite sort of, she asked me a number of questions, personal questions. And then, you know, after we'd exchanged a few, um, 
you know, we'd had a few exchanges. She suddenly turned around, Her Majesty, and says to me, so what's happening in Kashmir? And, and I looked at these uh, British, uh, you know, FCO people, and I sort of looked back and I said, well, you know, the Queen is asking me, so I am going to talk about it. So I then said, you know, uh, Your Majesty, you are the head of the Commonwealth. You know, you have a role to play. It's important. Britain must play a role. And uh, after all, you know, look at how you've managed to achieve the Northern Ireland uh, agreement. Uh, you've managed, uh, you know, there's an Irish peace deal. And she leaned across and she said, you don't want to follow that model, do you? And I thought, you know, this shows it was an instant sort of, you know, I mean, here is uh, the Queen and a very formal ceremony and yet there was an instant connection because in a way um, you know in a way it underlined the the closeness and warmth of the relationship the second uh, anecdote and I'll, I'll end here i think this is important it's of a different kind uh, in the wake of uh, the tragic uh, london bombings uh, of 2005 seven seven as they were called the bombings in london uh, you know it was a very very tragic moment uh, for everyone. Uh, and because people who were involved in this were of, you know, they were British, but they were of, you know, Pakistani origin. They were not born in Pakistan, uh, but they were, you know, the heritage, or their parents were, came from Pakistan. At any rate, this is the time that uh, the Prime Minister uh, of Britain invited me to 10 Downing Street uh, and, uh, you know, said in the wake of this and said, you know, we will need your help to reach out to your community because it's important that we get cooperation from your community uh, so that we can get to the bottom of what's been happening uh, and we can prevent something else. And of course, he was very concerned and I respect him for that. He was very concerned, so was the British government, that there should be no stigmatization of the Pakistani, of the British Pakistani community. And, you know, I appreciated that. So I won't go, go into detail about, you know, how we then cooperated and helped uh, in whatever way we could in terms of our our outreach from our High Commission in London uh, to the British Pakistani community, the leaders of the British Pakistani community, to explain to them that, you know, you're not going to be stigmatized, but if there's any way in which you can, you know, uh, be cooperative, it is important to get the condemnations of terrorism out quickly, swiftly, um, because that's how the, the population, the local population will also see uh, where you stand, you stand with them because you are British now. So I think, you know, I mean, Ian, I have read all his books, I think, and I read this one as well. And I just want to sort of, you know, ask one question uh, and then leave it there. Um, and he doesn't have to answer it until, you know, uh, High Commissioner Turner has also made his comments because I realize we're going to be running out of time uh, very, very soon. Uh, and my question really relates to the, 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 the historic sort of uh, role that uh, Britain played along with the United States at that time in mediating uh, over Kashmir. Uh, you know, it, it, it's fascinating uh, the way he recounts that. Uh, and what in his mind uh, led to the failure of those talks? Uh, you know, that would be an interesting question. These are, the, of course, the famous Bhutto uh, Swaran Singh uh, talks way back in, uh, in history. So I leave it there and I'll mm -hmm. hand it back to you, Yakub. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lodi, and um, I think uh, what you've point pointed out is very interesting, uh, and I think that was the main point here, is that it is a very critical two-way relationship. Uh, so yes, Britain kind of operates in a particular way in, in, in Pakistan, but then the Pakistan High Commission plays in some ways a very similar role there. And, you know, I was actually thinking that I, 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 I still remember when, when I was there with the first conservative government and there were moments that you wondered, you know, how many Pakistanis are, you know, Pakistani descent people are in, are in power in the UK. And it's, a, and it's a great thing, which, which shows the strength of the relationship that, you know, Pakistanis can go there and flourish uh, and uh, for that relationship to go forward. But when you were, you were talking, I just wanted to make like these uh, two quick comments, which uh, just came to my, my mind that I must, uh, uh, wonder that you know, you must be thinking uh, throughout your time as High Commissioner and afterwards that how much of Pakistani politics is actually decided in London and continues to be, uh, which makes you wonder that am I an interior minister or am I the Pakistan High Commissioner there because, you know, and it still continues. And I think that, you know, as from where you, be, you began talking about London and how, you know, close we actually feel to that, uh, 
even now London kind of feels as a part of Pakistan because everyone's there. And and in the summer, you can't walk down a single street in London without running into, you know, half of Pakistan that you actually know. So I always find that, find that fascinating. And just one last thing about the Queen. I was once uh, reading this very interesting anecdote uh, by the Nawab of Kalabagh, you know, when the, when, when the Queen visited Pakistan in the 60s. And the Nawab of Kalabagh uh, was getting a bit annoyed uh, so someone asked and said, well, what's the reason? And he said, well, you know, my job as the governor of West Pakistan is to introduce Her Majesty to, you know, the, 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 the notable people, but she seems to know everyone. Uh, <laughs> so there were moments that he was like, I will just like stand back. And, they, they, and he said that at the polo match where he actually just left the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh to talk to people because he said they know everyone. So I don't need to introduce them to anyone. And that again, you know, as you were talking about the Queen, that really shows the connection and the interest and the continued interest and connection that actually remains there. So anyways, so that brings us to the current High Commissioner, uh, Dr. Dr. Turner. Um, uh, of course, you know, there's a lot to, un to, uh, to unpack here. So. Uh, perhaps you could, you know, begin by uh, your reflection on the book, because, of course, that's the past of uh, the current office that, that you hold. Uh, and then, of course, uh, perhaps reflect on its, on its current work. Uh, Dr. Lodi has mentioned the great work of DFID and of the British, British Council. And, of course, there are myriad of ways in which the UK-Pakistan relationship kind of operates now. Um, and the question that I want to sort of attach towards the end of it is that with now Brexit happening, you know, that has happened. Uh, and Britain is more thinking more in terms of the Commonwealth, more in terms of, you know, uh, the non-European world as being critical. This is a ready-made connection that you have. Uh, so what is uh, perhaps even your personal thinking where this relationship can actually further strengthen? Because there are a number of ways in which this can be taken forward. And now with Britain kind of uh, rethinking its uh, uh, role in the role in the role in the world post post Brexit. How can the British Pakistani relationship go 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 further? So I know that's quite a lot, but uh, over to you. Yakub, thank you very much indeed, and it's a huge pleasure, uh, Professor, to be here. I loved the book, uh, Dr. Baliha, as ever, wonderfully insightful uh, comments. And can I start by saying, it's slightly humbling to uh, see this kind of rogues gallery of rascals who've preceded you and in such a great illumination um, and, and sort of feel the weight of that history in the office behind you. And um, uh, it really is, I think, the most wonderful piece of scholarship to, to bring all that together and, and put the personal lens on it, uh, but also the history of, of Pakistan, but the British role, uh, the British diplomacy therein together. So um, my, my huge congratulations uh, on the book. Um, I agree with an awful lot of what's been said, and I don't want to repeat it. And I think the central thread in, in the book, in um, Malheer, in, in your remarks, Yakub, how you framed it, of these, these ties of influence, the ties that bind, really resonates with me in the work I do uh, day to day. Um, in the end, ours, diplomacy is a contact sport. You know, we're learning that in, in the age of COVID. Uh, Zoom is all very well. Uh, we tried on another platform tonight, but it's not the same as being together. So I am strongly of the view in, although I am of the generation of the naked diplomats, was an early advocate of, of social media, of Twitter diplomacy. Uh, at the heart, our diplomacy is, is, is personal and a lot of it's very private. And that is about trust and relationships. And that's why you are, are going to carry on needing missions of really well-informed, well-judged uh, uh, diplomats on the ground who I hope are still doing the kind of brilliant work that uh, Sir Nicholas did with his uh, charts of uh, influence all those years ago. I'm pleased, by the way, Yakub, to find out where those charts are, because I asked when I arrived and Nicholas didn't seem to remember. So the fact that you've got them, I know where to come for them. Um, so, uh, look, to unpack that, I think one point, uh, Ian, that you made early on, I just want to emphasize, I think there is something very important in the history about the nature of, um, uh, I think, Yakub, it was your phrase, of the freedom struggle being against India. And my personal career experience is to compare my time here to my last High Commissioner posting, which was in Kenya, another former colony with uh, quite a difficult birth coming out of the emergency period and an independent struggle with a, a freedom movement known as the Mau Mau. Um, I mean, bloody in a, in a different and difficult way to, to partition. But um, uh, if I can do it without being too undiplomatic, my experience in Kenya was that the post-colonial relationship was a, a lot more loaded 
there was a lot more um, tension and angst in that relationship, as often happens in, in a post-colonial environment, um, albeit one that uh, independence in Kenya was, was 62, so it's a bit, a bit more recent. Um, but what I find here, it, it is a bit of a simplification, but I think you'll get the thrust of, of my point, that a lot of the, um, uh, the angst, if I can use that word, is directed at India and the way in which Pakistan, through much of its history, has defined itself in opposition to India, rather than at the UK. And what I get as a representative of the UK is that affection that we walk down a street in London and we just meet friends. You, after all, know us so well. Um, uh, we do well in the, in the balance of those two things where I think a lot of the difficulty is directed uh, against uh, India. But I really agree with the point, and, and uh, Ian, this comes out in the book, that those links are not just backwards looking. And sometimes, to come to your question, Yaku, people say, well, to play on the history and the, 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 the royalty and the diaspora is a slightly historic thing. And my lived experience here, and, and uh, Maliha, I think you're, you're very much reinforcing this, is it's absolutely not. It's present and it's vibrant and it's forward looking. Uh, your number of MPs, the highest number we've ever had, 15 uh, British MPs of uh, Pakistani origin. Um, although many are on one side of the political divide, which is a slightly different point. Um, uh, the uh, the, the 1.6 million rising fast, our largest diaspora, 2% of the population. If you look at a lot of what I've struggled with day to day in my time here, just this week, the red listing implications for probably 30,000 Brits who are in Pakistan. Um, uh, I have worked very hard to deepen our air links, uh, Virgin, BA, all those things is a symbol of that very modern forward facing bit of the relationship that I don't feel is remotely historic. So I very much agree with all of that relational diplomacy point. Uh, the second point I wanted to make was, um, it's come out in this conversation, but I want to be really explicit about it. It's the breadth of our business here. So as a diplomat, there's many countries you go to, uh, say I'm a high commissioner in Singapore. There's history, uh, there are people to people ties, but by and large, the thing that I'm doing is, is a commercial and trade piece of work. And what I find extraordinarily pr privileged about my time here is I'm doing the full suite of diplomatic business. And as Maliha says, that's everything from uh, the development relationship, which, by the way, historically has been much larger than USA. I won't let the Americans get the top prize on this. Um, uh, it's, it's our development, yes. It's our defense relationship, very, very close ties. When I was giving a speech at Quetta Staff College, you stand there before the board, sing Orkinlek, Montgomery, you know, all of that is there and still a very central part of what we do. Uh, it's our trade relationship, um, third largest trading partner for Pakistan. Uh, it's the British Council and the education. I could go on. I have 12 government departments working on my platform, and my high commission is still the largest high commission in the world, still the largest single mission in the world. And that is a product of just that sheer weight of the breadth, um, the home affairs issues. I have all of life uh, working for me. So that's the, uh, I, I think there's a very simple uh, breadth point. Um, and then a third, before I come to fully answer your question, Yakub. Um, there is something, I mean, maybe this is obvious, but in, this, in the relationship, there's something I find as a diplomat, Dr. Malia here is, is probably a far better diplomat than I, but it's hard to disguise when you just like being in a place. So if I look around my colleagues on the diplomatic enclave, let me be deeply undiplomatic at this point, you know, I can see the ones who like being here and the ones who don't. We all spot it a mile off. I will not name names. Uh, even in the privacy of a uh, broadcast, uh, <laughs> broadcast Zoom call. But there's something you can't legislate for. And because of those ties we're talking about, because of that affinity, I just defy a British High Commissioner to come to Islamabad or a Pakistani High Commissioner to go to London and not just enjoy themselves. And I hope that you can see in what I do in my public diplomacy, whether I'm skiing in the Swat Valley or uh, you know, doing the toss of cricket matches in Guada or speaking my Kharab Urdu, you know, it, it's just a it's a it's a wonderful place to be. The food is good. The people are great. The landscape is beautiful. And um, all of those ties actually just make that that ease of functioning and in a, in a serious note, deliver the kind of access that I'm very, very privileged to have here. And although I generally think you can guess who the others are, I probably punch at about number four currently on the list on uh, on, on the pecking order uh, in this town. 
um, uh, my access is, is bluntly second to none because of those ties and the good work we can do together. Finally, to your question, Yakub, and I, I'm pleased you asked it because I think this is quite important. It's the one thing um, you came towards at the end of the, the book uh, in, but, but I think is, is worth reflection is I would, ref I would observe that our relationship is going through quite a big transition at the minute. And if I look at the last 20 years of British diplomacy here, most of it pivoted around three basic things. The first was security and what the Americans called the war on terror, not a phrase I like very much, but very much seen through the lens of um, uh, the NATO effort, uh, the American led by the NATO effort in Afghanistan and Pakistan's role in that. And most of my predecessors uh, in the last 20 years primarily were discussing security issues. Um, second uh, is our development relationship. Some of the deep, uh, the deep poverty uh, that existed in pockets in Pakistan uh, that we've already touched on. And third was that diaspora, that people to people link. The first two of those are in the middle of a fundamental change. Uh, as the US moves to withdraw from Afghanistan, uh, the UK will leave as well. And the enormous achievement in the gains in domestic security in Pakistan in the last five or so years, a 90% reduction in domestic security incidents. Uh, a lot of what I do is rail against that slightly negative stereotype of Pakistan based on that, which now is, is a very, very different context. Uh, and then, of course, the aid relationship is changing, not just because of the murder of, uh, merger of DFID and the Foreign Office, uh, the deep cuts to British aid because of the recession uh, from COVID, but actually most importantly because Pakistan is now at lower middle income status and the, the era when uh, UK was spending lots of money on building schools, building roads is gone. As, as Dr. Maliha says, it's a far more targeted technical assistance that you would expect in a middle income country. So my strategy, what I'm doing a lot of, is trying to pivot to a, a focus on uh, job creation and inclusive economic growth. The future stability of Pakistan can only be secured if jobs are created for the 110 million or so under 30, a population that has doubled since 1990, I think an extraordinary statistic. And the vision of the current government, um, it's not mine to be a cheerleader for this government or oppose it, it's mine to support British interests, but the vision I think is the correct one of economic connectivity, of regional connectivity to drive economic growth. And I think given all that we've discussed, Britain has got to put itself absolutely bang in the heart of that and use its relational, soft, um, sentimental ties uh, to help, uh, help drive that. Back to you, Yaku. I hope that's answered your question. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, and I must say, you have, you have uh, done it uh, in depth, but also very succinctly. So I was trying to learn and say, wow, he's actually said all those things. <laughs> so I'm very impressed. As an academic, I just keep on talking. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but let me go back to Ian, because of course, uh, uh, Dr. Lodi has asked the question about uh, Kashmir uh, and uh, Britain's role in that. Uh, but let me also add it with one of the questions uh, we have uh, received. Uh, and this, and this uh, question is asking that uh, what role has uh, Britain played in shaping domestic policy in Pakistan? Uh, and this person is asking, do you, do you, do you cover that? Uh, that does Britain affect how domestically things are run in Pakistan? So maybe we can sort of, you know, deal with these two questions. I think, I think that um, certainly uh, Britain in the last two decades or so has been nudging in the direction uh, that Christian was mentioning in terms of inclusive economic growth and development. And certainly there has been a gender aspect to, to this in terms of education uh, and other work encouraging uh, NGO activities uh, in areas of empowerment. So I think that uh, Britain is uh, working alongside those groups uh, within Pakistan who are, uh, are looking uh, to social cohesion being strengthened uh, by Pakistan becoming uh, a, a more uh, inclusive society. And I think that that really is very important. Uh, it's it, that um, the uh, security of Pakistan is often in the past always been discussed in military terms, but uh, really it's, it's got to be looked at in terms of social inclusion, I think, and the breaking down of some of these uh, inequalities uh, that uh, still uh, persist uh, in Pakistan, despite its uh, economic successes. 
uh, and I think that that uh, is an important area uh, going forward. Uh, I certainly take the point about job creation and, and the youth, because uh, the so-called youth bulge, which is often discussed and written about, uh, could be either a great uh, driver of the Pakistan economy, or it could be, and, and development of the country as a whole, or it could become a liability uh, in terms of social cohesion. And I think that that is, is really a, a, an important issue. As far as um, Kashmir is concerned, I, I mean, Britain's involvement over the seven decades in terms of media, trying to mediate uh, when it's able to do so, although of course India looks at this as a bilateral uh, issue, uh, post uh, Shimla really. Uh, it, it always, I think, is founded ultimately, despite the chances of breakthrough uh, from time to time, and they've been uh, there uh, on a number of occasions, uh, because of the mistrust between the two countries. And that is where, of course, um, confidence building measures uh, really are important in creating, I think, the background and the mood music for this ingrained mistrust, uh, which is there, uh, to, to be put to one side. Because until that happens, I don't think there is ever going to be uh, an opportunity for a major breakthrough uh, in, in terms of the resolution of this. And um, anything, I think, that um, outside actors can do to try and help um, mitigate some of this mistrust uh, it will really be beneficial you know in, in creating this situation in which the two countries themselves you know can um, move on and, and come to a, something as a win-win situation I know again that's another cliche which is often used but it's got to be a win-win situation for both both countries to, to have a meaningful um, resolution of this. And that will only happen uh, when there's a, a much greater degree of trust between the two countries than has existed, I think, in the past. Great. Um, we've received another question, but I think perhaps uh, Dr. Lodi can uh, tackle that because uh, you, were, you were talking about uh, you know, when you were high commissioner and you kept explaining to Islamabad how the British are different than the Americans and don't follow their lead, because the, the uh, question actually asks is that have there been occasions, and perhaps you can speak from, from, from your personal experience, and it says, have there been occasions where the British have, in fact, tempered or changed American policy towards Pakistan? That's a difficult one to answer, but I think, uh, you know, from my own personal knowledge, um, you won't find this in any of the books, I guess. Although uh, the US and Britain work very closely together on many of their shared foreign policy objectives uh, in the region, uh, I think Britain has been less, uh, you know, let's say less keen on policies of sanctions and embargoes. So I think there Britain did from time to time quietly advise uh, Washington to the extent that they could, uh, because you know every country acts according to its own interests. It does listen to others, but that doesn't mean that uh, you know their policies are determined by others. But I think at key moments uh, there were uh, British interventions with Washington, uh, advising Washington not to follow a coercive policy vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan whether that was on the nuclear program, as you know, um, you know, uh, Pakistan came under multiple sanctions uh, for its nuclear and missile program. Now, Britain had similar concerns, uh, but it ne didn't necessarily think that uh, sanctioning Pakistan was going to achieve the outcomes that both the UK and uh, the United States wanted. So I think that's a case in point. Uh, and at other times, also, I think uh, this has been, uh, you know, uh, and I think one, one of the things that I certainly noticed, again, this is not so much in London, but more in Islamabad, was, you know, uh, usually the British High Commissioner was a very well-informed person. And High Commissioner Turner knows all about this. <laughs> He's very well-informed too. <laughs> and often other diplomats, because one of the things we learn in diplomacy is 
you must identify a very well-informed diplomat in the town that you're accredited to, befriend that person, and see how much you can you know, soak away from that person. I mean, that's the advice I got from one of the most illustrious diplomats Pakistan has produced, uh, who's your namesake, actually, Sabzada Yaqub. Uh, when I was being posted to Washington, one of the pieces of advice he gave to me, because I was a rookie, as the Americans call it, I had no experience. And he said, do this. You must identify who is well-informed. It could be anybody. But so I think, you know, many times uh, other, uh, the, the uh, sort of, let's say, the envoys of other countries would turn to, let's say, the Mark Lyle Grants of the world or the Nicholas Barrington's of the world or the Christian Turner's of the world uh, of, to sort of say, what do you think about this? What is your assessment? And I think that is a tribute uh, to something that Ian talks about in his book. It's a tribute to the quality of British diplomats who are accredited to Islamabad. I think that very fact shows the priority that London gives to Islamabad. It posts some of the best and the brightest uh, to Islamabad. And I'd like to say that we also post some of the nice ones to London. <laughs> so I, I, <laughs> I'm pleased you added that last bit, Maliha. <laughs> you know, you were you were mentioning Sabzada Yakub. I'm actually named after him. Uh, so, and of course, you know, till he passed away, I, I used to really enjoy my conversations with him. Acha, we have another question uh, which Ian can easily answer. But since Ian can easily answer, I will put it to the High Commissioner <laughs> because that will uh, sort of uh, get some reflection uh, on what's happening now. And the question is uh, that how does the British diplomatic mission, well, this is more about the FCO than I think the personal diplomatic missions here. How does the FCO kind of deal between India and Pakistan? Because they are competing notions and competing interests of both India and Pakistan. So how is that competition kind of dealt with? And of course, you know, Ian has uh, spoken about this uh, in a historical framework, but perhaps Dr. Turner can speak about it in the current one, because that's a perennial question. Um, how to deal with both India and Pakistan, where both India and Pakistan are so closely tied to the UK. Both diasporas are huge, the trade relations are huge, everything is really so integrally related, but both countries are at loggerheads. So how is this dealt with by the High Commissioner? Perhaps you can you know, say a few words on that. Yeah, it's a great question, Yakub, and actually it takes me back to the question you asked me about Britain's position as it leaves the EU and, and looks, uh, looks to the world. Um, I mean, first of all, for the sort of narrow lens that um, uh, tonight's book is talking about, uh, you know, there's a parallel story to tell about um, uh, British diplomacy in India, which is actually very different, I think, given the very different uh, nature and texture of that relationship. Uh, you can be quite sure uh, that um, uh, a diplomat like myself and my mission keeps very close to our counterparts in New Delhi. Uh, who many of us have served with elsewhere. The current High Commissioner just uh, appointed in New Delhi. Um, uh, Alex Ellis is, is what you would call a batchmate of mine, a close friend. So there's a lot of conversations we have and even travel between to make sure we're comparing notes and understanding. Uh, and I do think, you know, at, at the heart of that, that well-informed nature of diplomacy that uh, Dr. Lodi is describing, um, uh, you know, that basic ability to understand and inform is a very important part of what we do as a network. So that is there. But I think the question belies a broader point that, that is, is there in this conversation, which is about how Pakistan, for much of its history, has identified itself in opposition to India. And I think what I'm saying about the current, uh, I think, juncture in, in not just British diplomacy towards Pakistan, but also Pakistan's own regional and international policy is whether it can carry on doing that. So, um, uh, you know, India's army is larger, India's economy is what, seven times bigger than Pakistan. And a country like Britain, along with many others, uh, particularly for us as we go through Brexit, is of course going to be deepening its economic investment with India. That is, that is just without a shadow of doubt what is going to, uh, what is going to happen. And uh, we published uh, 10 days ago, a big uh, integrated review. We called it of our international policy, our foreign and defense and security policy, which had this uh, thing in it called the Indo-Pacific tilt, a deeper uh, um, strengthening of our ties uh, from really Pakistan eastwards um, through places like 
um, everywhere from Vietnam to Malaysia to South uh, Korea and Japan. That makes economic sense for us. My point is, we cannot allow an up arrow on India, which makes complete strategic sense, to equate to a simple down arrow on Pakistan. That sort of seesaw, that binary approach to the world, uh, is, is completely reductive uh, and would not be in anyone's interest. To flip that to um, a question to, um, uh, to folks in Islamabad who are thinking about this, Pakistan doesn't simply want to become a client state of China. And I think the only thing we probably haven't discussed enough in the last hour of this conversation is the role of China. Much of the historic lens has been about the world's big superpower, America, and how Britain has interfaced with America in terms of its policy in South Asia. But now the big geostrategic question of our age is the um, growing confrontation between the US and China and uh, the, the, the slight cliche of the Thucydides trap. And I think there is a, a deeper uh, set of um, conversations to have about how Pakistan positions itself in that, um, how it uh, maintains its very important ties with China, economically, politically, and otherwise, which uh, to my mind, I don't see as a, a threat um, uh, you know, I've said publicly before that things like um, uh, CPEC do not need to be a concern to us if it's done in the right way with the right investments, um, that the benefit Pakistan and don't lead to debt traps and everything else. Um, but how that relationship is developed in a way that doesn't lead it into a binary zero sum approach and allows Pakistan to have a strong sovereign policy in the region um, as a counterweight, perhaps, to, to China and India. So that's quite a, uh, a complicated shift, but I think it's an issue that we need to be discussing uh, more. Uh, the right outcome um, is a very positive one in which Britain can be a very close partner of Pakistan. A negative one is a simple seesaw that has, um, uh, I think, a very negative uh, view of, 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 if you like, Pakistan rushing into China's outstretched arms, if I can put it like that. Of course, actually, uh, Dr. Lodi, before you even indicated you, you, you wanted to speak, I actually wanted to come back to you, to you on this because having read your columns o o over the last couple of months, you know, uh, this is exactly, uh, a lot of this is exactly what you, you have been discussing. So yes, please, please do. Uh, I think, you know, I'd like to make three quick comments uh, because, you know, we'd like Ian to come in as well. Three quick comments on what uh, High Commissioner Turner has said. First of all, I think, um, you know, I think we have to get past this perception that Pakistan defines itself in terms of India. Uh, uh, I belong to the post-independence generation and you belong to the post-post-independence generation, Yakub. Uh, and we do not define ourselves that way. We do live next door to a big neighbor, uh, which has a dominant influence on our foreign policy, no question about it. But my identity is not defined by anything extraneous to me. I am a Pakistani and I was born in Pakistan, a free country. So I think, <clears throat> I think this, this sort of, uh, this perception I would, I would take issue with. Uh, this is not exactly the way uh, many of us think, both of ourselves and as, as, as well as of the country. Secondly, uh, I think Pakistan has no issue with the, another country having a relationship uh, with India. Uh, that is the sovereign choice of any country just as we exercise our sovereign choice to have a relationship with whichever country we wish to. What affects us, and so, so we do not have a zero-sum uh, view at all. What does, uh, you know, I think what we do say, and perhaps it is perceived uh, in, uh, in a zero-sum way, is that what you do with that country should not be at our expense. In other words, if country, let's say, A, is supplying high-tech weaponry, uh, to our big neighbor, or missile technology, or anti-ballistic missile technology, that affects and distorts further an imbalance, which is dangerous for two nuclear neighbors. Because if you have everything completely out of balance, then nuclear deterrence is affected by that. And you know, this is a well-known, I'm not coming, coming up with something original. This is well-known. There has to be a degree of some balance. So I think that's where we are. I mean, countries, of course, will have a relationship with the, our big neighbor. But as I said, it's only the problem occurs when it, we feel that it has a fallout on us in this sense. Trade, all of those relationships, of course, I mean, countries, as I said, have a sovereign choice. Thirdly, China. I think Pakistan and Pakistanis are very clear. 
that our country's strategic future lies with China. This is the Asian century. Uh, this is about our region, which is asserting itself in so many different ways. Uh, so I think what we are trying to do right now is to navigate also through what you rightly identified uh, as a difficult era where the United States and China, if not in confrontation, but they are in intense competition. So Pakistan would like to preserve its good relationship with the, the United States and hope that at least the Biden administration, unlike its predecessor uh, administration, will not see, will not have a zero sum view that if Pakistan has a close relationship with China, well, then it can't, it'll be our unfriend. Well, we won't be your unfriend, but we will not, certainly not sign up to, I mean, that, that's where I think that's the red line that Pakistan draws. We will not sign up to anything which smacks of a containment of China policy or strategy. That you will not see Pakistan, uh, you know, <laughs> lining up to do that. That's a red line. So I think, you know, we would like, I think Pakistan, Pakistanis would like good relations uh, with Western countries, even though I think the notion of the West is now <laughs> something that one has to re-examine because so much has happened post-Brexit. Uh, countries are pursuing their own policies, uh, which is fine. Uh, so are we. But we do think that uh, our relationship with China uh, will not come at the expense. We don't want it to come at the expense of our relationship with the United States. But if Washington perceives it that way, then I, I think it needs to wake up to the fact that, as I said, our strategic destiny and future is China and not Washington. I'll end there. No, no, if very, I may, very, yeah. If I may, Yakub, I, yeah, I just sure. wanted to say, I think, Malia, we are violently agreeing. It's exactly that kind of nuanced, <laughs> balanced approach, which I'm uh -huh. arguing is necessary uh -huh. uh, and that we need a deeper articulation of rather than a binary view, which is a stereotype that is too lazily applied to Pakistan in some Western capitals. You know, I, I, I should say that one of the good and the bad things about any talk like, like this is that Towards the end of it, you actually re realize we need another two hours to discuss the questions that have now come now come up. But perhaps you know that's that's for another panel. But I just wanted to quick quickly comment on what the high uh, what the high commissioner and Dr. Lodi also also mentioned uh, this whole sort of Pakistan's uh, perception. And because I I uh, wrote a paper on this a couple of years ago, uh, where historically Pakistan did see itself as not India, and that kind of shaped Pakistan's policy for 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 a while. Uh, and then, of course, Pakistan changed, and then you know the separation of East Pakistan affected it further, and all of all of that. But what I really find fascinating is that India is now increasingly defining itself as not Pakistan. So where Pakistan could have had that syndrome because it was a smaller country, it was more impoverished, it had myriad of problems, but now India is increasingly every year India is more acting as if we are not Pakistan, and it seems to be obsessed. You know, I I, I still remember talking to Indian diplomats a decade or so ago. And, you know, they would say that, yes, of course, we think about Pakistan and, you know, we talk about Pakistan and all of that and, you know, at the UN and at other places. But now they just seem to be obsessed by it. So it's not just in Pakistan, you know, and I think, you know, Dr. Dr. Lodi is very right that it's really gone down dramatically in terms of Pakistan, but it's actually picked up dramatically in India, where the not Pakistan thing or defining yourself against Pakistan is become a huge thing. But I shall uh, go back now to Ian for the last word. Uh, and of course, you have lots of comments uh, that, that, that you can take up on. Uh, but also, perhaps, maybe one could end on some fun anecdotes, uh, you know, uh, from the book. Because, of course, there, there, there are lots of personal interesting things uh, that, that you talk about. So maybe you can ref reflect a bit on the, dis on the discussion, of course. Uh, and of course, you know, the whole continuing, uh, you know, Chinese policy, because a lot of people forget that Pakistan's Chinese policy, China policy is not uh, from CPEC, you know, Pakistan's China policy is from the 60s and in fact has deeper roots than that. Uh, so this is not just something that Pakistan has just re realized or has begun to indulge in in the last couple of years. So maybe you can do a, a kind of a broad reflection on what's being discussed um, and then, you know, you can share some anecdotes, some interesting bits. Okay, thank you, Yakub. Um, the China uh, point that you made, I think, is, is important that certainly even before the 1962 conflict uh, between China and India, Pakistan was beginning to develop 
uh, interests uh, in China. Uh, so there is this history. Obviously, today everyone looks at it very much in the CPEC uh, category, you know, and it's and it's often cliche called a game changer, you know, for for Pakistan. But it has a longer uh, history uh, than that, and I think that that that's quite uh, an important point uh, because it enables, I think, uh, this multi-layered approach rather than the binary approach, uh, you know, which, which both uh, Malaya and Christian mentioned, you know, uh, which would have all kinds of dangers for, for Pakistan in its relations with um, America and uh, the West generally. So I think that the awareness that there's historic ties with China in fact, you could probably trace them to much earlier, of course, if we want to go back, you know, in time way beyond uh, the creation of Pakistan, uh, trading ties. And I think that uh, reconnecting some of these uh, these ties, but in a way which is not uh, driven by uh, necessarily purely strategic concerns, uh, but taking advantage of, of Pakistan's uh, geo strategic position. Uh, often writers have talked about Pakistan being the victim uh, of, of its um, geography. Actually, its geography can work for it. It can be a connector uh, with a variety of different worlds. And I think that that, that is important, looking at uh, the relationship with China and Pakistan's position uh, as we go forward. I think um, Certainly, there will be changes, you know, in um, inevitably each era brings up its own um, sort of transformations. There's going to be changes in terms of how UK relates to Pakistan uh, in the future. Uh, but those changes are still going to be rooted in this large um, diasporic community. Uh, within the UK, and, and I think that that's a very important uh, sort of anchor going forward. I, I think there still will be the ties of sentiment, uh, but I think that this community is, is going to be increasingly important going forward in terms of uh, Britain's role in Pakistan, Britain's image in Pakistan, and the kind of things it may seek to try and achieve alongside Pakistanis. Uh, as far as anecdotes relating to the the volume. I mean, that inevitably, um, there are all of these very colourful characters uh, that uh, you're, you're dealing with and you're coming across uh, as you research this. Uh, I'm thinking of the um, sort of uh, Gilbert Lathwaite as, as a character, for example, uh, out of the Raj in some respects, and yet also very much aware of a changing uh, Britain's role within Pakistan. And this is at the time he was High Commissioner when, of course, the United States was uh, beginning to become an important figure uh, in terms of aid, country in terms of aid uh, for Pakistan. I, I can think of the, um, the, the colourful portraits of uh, key figures uh, in Pakistani history uh, that come out of uh, diplomatic appreciations, whether it's Surawadi and his ballroom dancing, or whether it's other figures within uh, Pakistan's history that um, are, are sort of perhaps really uncovered in the, um, the sort of valedictory messages which uh, diplomats sometimes uh, leave behind when they can actually say what they think, you know, in terms of the people that they've been dealing with. And, and I tried to put some of these anecdotes uh, within the the volume itself. Um, I think that um, looking at my own connections with Pakistan, which go back over a long period of time, I mean, one of the things which uh, strikes me very much is the, um, the differences today because of um, the information technology revolution and, and my first visit, carting a typewriter around Pakistan to make notes while I was doing my research, uh, having to book a phone call, sometimes two or three days in advance, uh, if I wanted to ring my parents back in the UK. I mean, the, these are sort of really things which strike you. You know, we, t we take so much for granted. Perhaps this one of the lessons that we might uh, have from the last year is that um, we always need to reflect on the things that we take for granted. 
but and not always assume you know that uh, they are so readily available to us everyone's had to make uh difficult adjustments in the last year but we often take instantaneous communication ability to travel anywhere you want uh, whenever you want to meet whoever you want uh, at, uh, for granted and I, and I think that uh, that's something to to take away from both the studying of uh, this history but also our own personal histories okay great um, well I, I, I was just reminded of this very interesting anecdote, uh, which I once once read, and, and perhaps that could also illustrate uh, diplomacy, uh, British diplomacy in Pakistan. As all of you know, you know we had this um, the Rawalpindi conspiracy case, uh, you know, in the in the in the early years of Pakistan, where a major general of the army, Major General Akbar Khan, was uh, indicted and sent to to jail. Now, it was very interesting that Major General Akbar Khan had won uh, the Distinguished Service Order and uh, the George Cross. Now, of course, when he was uh, con convicted, uh, both these medals were taken back. But since they were granted by the Secretary of State of India, the government of Pakistan had to write to the British government uh, to uh, uh, ask them to, to take them back. But because India, you know, at that time, you know, had its own Secretary of State and everything, the British government said, well, in fact, you have to write to the crown. You have to write to the, to the queen. And the queen was, you know, had just been there a, a couple of years, didn't really know what to do. And she said, well, if my Pakistan ministers are saying that we should take them back, let's take them back. So those were taken back. Fast forward a few decades and Major General Akbar Khan is released and is now the military advisor to the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. And what he does in his first meeting with the British now ambassador, because Pakistan has actually left the Commonwealth, is saying, can I please get my medals back? Now, this creates this interesting drama where the ambassador is like, um, this is the first meeting you are ha having with me and all you want to talk about are your medals and Akbar Khan says well actually I'm really proud of my work in the second world war and I really cherish those medals can I get them back so he writes to the FCO and saying well this is what's what's happened and they write to the palace and the palace says well it's kind of very awkward what to do here because we took them back he was convicted of a crime the Pakistan government asked for this and now he's asking uh, uh, for, the, for them to be back and then what happened was you know and I think that's a very typical but a very kind of wonderful example of British diplomacy that someone in the FCO figured out that since it had not been gazetted that the medals had been taken back, he could have, he can quietly receive them back because it had not been declared in the London Gazette that these medals had been taken back. So they quietly give him back the medals. He's happy. No one really knows. And, you know, 50 years down the line, now we know because those documents have been declassified. Uh, so, so it shows again this kind of this long term connection and how this diplomacy works and it and it always reminds me of of that uh, very uh, interesting in incident when we had uh, Sir Mark Lyle Grant, uh, uh, um, he was the keynote at the Think Fest last year, and someone who didn't know him well, I think said, you know, how long has your association been with Pakistan? And he said, well, if you're talking about my family, just over 100 years. Uh, and this per person was like shell shocked. And he's like, yeah, look at my name, there might be a hint, hint, hint there somewhere. So I think it's, it's been a wonderful panel. Uh, we have wonderfully gone over time, but you know, that's one of the good things about being the organ organizer, I can just do that. And at least on Zoom, we can kind of push it a bit. Uh, but thank you so much uh, for uh, speaking to us here. Uh, thank you, Ian, for writing a meticulously researched and a wonderful book. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Lodi, uh, for your insights uh, from the other side. Uh, I think that's very important to always make sure that it's, you know, sort of balanced out uh, in that sense. And of course, thank you, High Commissioner uh, Dr. Christian Turner, for your time uh, and for your ref reflection. And I think a very important point, and I think maybe that's the last uh, kind of uh, take takeaway, that it's not just rooted in the past, even though today we might be launching a book that's about the past, but it's solidly about the future and it's solidly about going forward together. Uh, so again, thank you, uh, all of you. And I hope that at the ThinkFest in January, we can actually replicate the panel uh, in person and then ask all the awkward questions uh, that are coming in the in the comments. I'll just uh, mention mention two, which you can't perhaps answer here, but perhaps in a in a in a more private session, one can. Uh, one of the questions was, when is Britain going to send back criminals to Pakistan? Um, and the other was, what was the role of Britain in Benazir's deal? So you could see the line of uh, questions that are coming in. But but uh, that's for another time and at another uh, 
uh, session. Thank so thank you, you so you. much again uh, and have a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.